Finally, a handheld that can play Pokemon Blue at full speed. Hey everyone and welcome back to Joey's Retro Handhelds. I'm Joey and today we're going to be taking a first look at the AYN Odin 2. I say first look as this will just be a quick look at the device. This is not going to be my full review. I received it, played around with it, and want to make a quick video just to get some information out there and to give you an idea of what to expect from a first impressions perspective. Full disclosure, this device was sent to me for review by AYN directly. They have no input into anything I say, they haven't seen this video ahead of time, and they won't see the review video ahead of time either. All right, let's jump right in because this is one I was super excited to receive and a lot of you are super excited to hear about. Let's get the specs and price out of the way right now. This handheld starts at 294 US dollars for the base 8 gig, 128 gig model, and it only comes in black. This is all through their Indiegogo campaign, which I'll link in the description. The next step up is the 12 gig, 256 gig Pro model at 370 US dollars, which is the tier where other colors are added. And then we have the max model with 16 gigs and 512 gigs of storage at 447 US dollars. So that's nice and all, but what do you actually get at those prices? And the answer is everything but the kitchen sink. Seriously, the specs on this handheld are insane, especially for a 300 US dollar starting point. We have the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, 8 to 16 gigs of RAM depending on the model, a 6 inch 1080p screen, micro HDMI, Wi Fi 7, Android 13, a massive 8000 milliamp battery, active cooling, analog triggers, hall sticks, and the list goes on. Honestly, let me just show you it all today and you can go from there. For anyone not familiar with the processor, this is the same that Samsung used on their S23 lineup. And coincidentally, what I'm actually filming this video on with the S23 Ultra. This is an extremely powerful processor that'll get us upscaled GameCube, Wii, PlayStation 2, and even Nintendo Switch. It's fair to say that for a lot of people, myself included, this is basically an endgame type processor and device for Android emulation and just gaming as a whole. Any game incompatibilities are due to the emulator, not the performance of the processor, especially at this point. So if your question is, can this handheld play X? The answer is yes. It's just yes. Let's take a look at what's in the box and then move on to the tour. They gave me their 100 watt charger, which I didn't use for this video, but I'll test that out for the full review. You know, if AYN and Retroid want to squash the rumor that they're not the same company, they really should start doing things differently. Exhibit number one is the actual box and how they both do the markings for colors and model. I have the 12 gigabyte model here for review and it's the black color. Inside the box is the manual with specs and information, then we have the actual device, as well as the USB charging cable. Taking a look at the device, and this is one good looking handheld just right out of the box. So let's do an actual tour of what we have here, and some of my initial thoughts after using it for a little bit. Anyone familiar with my channel knows that devices for me live and die by their controls and I'm happy to report that all of these controls feel fantastic. It all starts with the sticks, and we don't have switch sticks here anymore. We have actual fantastic joysticks. There's a nice range of motion here, they're easy to push and use, and they have that smooth feeling that we've come to enjoy. The easiest comparison that I have here is the ROG Ally or the Retroid Pocket 2S. If you're a fan of the sticks on those, then this is more for you. Looking at the D-pad, and we have a dome switch D-pad here. Once again, anyone that's used a Retroid Pocket 3 Plus or a 2S will feel right at home here, as it has that same loose, easy to push feeling. Let's do a quick diagonal test with Pokemon, 
And you can see here that the character sticks to the same direction that I push down on the D-pad, which is a good sign that the rate of false diagonals should be low on this. I'm not a fighting game guy, so Rust will still be your go-to for Hadoukens and Churyukens. Jumping to the face buttons, and we're using membrane style buttons here, and they are actually a nice size for the shell. There's no baby buttons here, we have actual usable face buttons that feel good. Nothing gets stuck, they're easy to push down, and easy to use multiple buttons at once for a run and jump combination. Then we have the four other buttons here which are start and select and home and back. These have a clicky feel and are just fine to use. For me, I tend to use select as one of my retro arch hotkeys and the feel on this is good enough for that which works for me. While we're here, let's do an audio test with the front firing speakers because they honestly sound great and I want to share it. Looking at the top of the device, and we have the SD card slot, micro HDMI port, volume buttons, and power button. The power button is a bit recessed in, and it also acts as a fingerprint sensor, if you want that. But what we really care about is these triggers. L1 and R1 are nice and clicky and feel pretty good to use, but the L2 and R2 are where the magic's at. They're analog triggers, which are an absolute necessity for the type of games we can play on this device. And they have nice travel here and just overall feel great. I'm kind of repeating myself, but again, the controls on this device are fantastic. Then at the bottom of the device, we have the 3.5mm audio jack, which is nice to see that we still have that, especially given Android has Bluetooth audio lag issues in a lot of scenarios. And then we have the USB-C charging port here as well that supports 65 watt quick charging. So I'd suggest grabbing a 100 watt charger just for overhead in case. On the back we have the fan intake as well as two mappable buttons. Now is a good time as any to talk about the fan. First, there were three known issues I was told about ahead of time for this device. And the first is currently there's no manual mode setting for fan speed, but it's on their list to fix. We'll talk about the other two issues later. So we have three profiles for fan. There's quiet, smart, and sport. And you can also just turn the fan off. Quiet is what I use for the entire video. It's not audible at all, and I have to put my ear right up against the back to make sure it's even running. Smart is the next step up, and that can get loud depending on the content, and Sport is the really loud fan option. Personally, after testing everything today, mine will stay in quiet forever as I don't see a need to change it. But if you're pushing the device to its limits, you might need that Sport option. Now, I can't talk about the fan without talking about the performance modes. They're standard, performance, and high performance. I was in performance mode for the entire video. High performance locks you into only being able to do smart or sport fan modes. No quiet. Performance allows all three, and so does standard. Overall, from a fan noise perspective, it's basically the same as any x86 device when it gets really going, just to give you a point of reference. Now, overall, from an ergonomics and comfort perspective, this is honestly as good as it gets. This device feels fantastic to hold, and it's something that I don't think will ever need a grip, and they did a really good job with this. I can't overstate this enough, at no point have I felt tired holding this device or had any issues holding it. The weight, the ergonomics, and all of it are top tier. Before we talk about software, let's get into some size comparisons to give you an idea of where this fits in. First up is the AYN Loki, and it shares a lot of similarities with the Odin 2. Next, here's the Ioneo Air Plus, since no one wants to buy this off me and it was around. For a larger comparison, here's the Asus ROG Ally. 
just using those three for actual sizes to give you some sort of range to keep an eye on at home. I've never owned an Odin 1, so I can't compare it to that unfortunately. And then we have the S23 Plus with the Game Vice Flex controller, and this is how I've been using my S23 Ultra. Since I use my phone to film, I used my wife's S23 Plus instead for this comparison. But out of all of these devices, the Odin is the best and most comfortable feeling by far. Let's talk about the software now, and this is running Android 13 with AYN's custom build. Two things to mention here that are known issues. The boot logo and video isn't finalized, and they need to be redesigned. And their wizard tool has some UI elements that need to be improved. Neither of those take away from the device at all, so they're just kind of additions. One other issue that I've run into personally is if you're using the navigation mode instead of gestures, it doesn't seem to disappear in a lot of scenarios where you want full screen. I found this a lot in the Vita 3K emulator, where the controls just didn't want to disappear for me. Now, it's not a big issue and this is something that's probably easily fixable, but I couldn't figure it out. There's even a setting to allow it to disappear in full screen, and that also didn't work. So it's a minor issue, but it is something I want to mention so far. I have to hand it to them. Exhibit number two is the setup wizard when you first start the device. It feels eerily familiar, right Retroid? Either way, missing the adding of the emulators part, which might be a good thing despite Retroid having them always out of date, but otherwise it's the same idea here. Same sort of setup as a Retroid device. Next up is the Odin settings, and here is exhibit number three. Or they're just copying each other at this point. You can enable joystick LEDs, side LED, choose the color, but random isn't an option like the ally does. You have to actually pick a color. I found a setting called charging separation, and I have no idea what that does. You can swap ABXY between Xbox and Nintendo layouts, set L2 and R2 to both so it works with Daijisho, and you can map the back buttons. Otherwise, there's the slide out panel when you're in game with the key mapper and some other stats, which just might be exhibit number four. I also checked out Test UFO to see if the panel is 60Hz, and it is, and confirmed that again in RetroArt's video settings, so there's no weird panel hertz going on here. A lot of people are concerned about input lag. Let me boot up Super Mario World as my personal test to see if there is any, and there wasn't anything that I could notice. Give me more time with the device and I'll report back in my review, but throughout all of the games that I played today, I didn't feel lag in any way. Alright, let's jump into some games, and I wanted to start with Call of Duty Mobile here to see if the controls were natively mapped, and the answer is no. There's no way to get it working besides mapping the touchscreen controls using Odin's mapping software. I didn't do it today, but I'll have what that looks like in the review. Let's get into some emulation now. We're gonna start off with Pokemon Blue on the Game Boy. I'm kidding, we're not gonna do that. I might have understated just how powerful this device is, but we really don't have any trouble running anything here from any generation. So we're just gonna skip all of the older generation systems. We're not gonna be using any PAL ROMs for any system, and it's full NTSC for everything. I'll point out any settings I've changed for any games, but other than that, everything was ran with default emulator settings and no changes out of the box. So let me start with an upscale test of Nintendo 64 with widescreen using Mario Tennis, which is my benchmark game. We're using the M64 Plus FZ emulator right off the Play Store, and my goal here is to see how far we can push Nintendo 64, as Mario Tennis is one of the harder games to run. And you can see here at 1440 by 1080 with widescreen, we are running absolutely perfectly. There's not a single issue that I can see. So as a whole, this means that Nintendo 64 can be upscaled to Odin 2's native resolution or higher 
without any concern, and even with widescreen if you wanted. Next, let's look at PSP at a 4 times upscale, and we'll start with Valkyrie Profile Lenith, a game that I've seen have issues in battles, especially on my Retroid Pocket Flip and other T618 devices. And then we'll take a look as well at another game here with YS7. Is it Ys or YS? I don't know, but you know what I mean. So yeah, four times PSP is achievable here and every game is going to run just fine. Moving on to Nintendo 3DS with a 4 times upscale to 1600 by 960 and we're using Citra MMJ here and we're going to be looking at Tales of the Abyss to start. And with all of the 3DS games that we look at, it only has to do with stuttering. That's the major issue here is while shaders are compiling, you're gonna get some stuttering. But when Citra Canary gets improved a little bit more and we get Vulcan support that's a little bit better, as well as the ability to swap screens, 3DS is gonna be more than perfect here, especially at a max resolution at four times upscale. And now the good stuff. Let's do PlayStation 2 first here at a 3 times upscale, and we can actually start with Sly Cooper 1. Moving on, let's check out Gran Turismo 4. Okay, so both of those games are running perfectly. What about GTA San Andreas? And let's wrap up with a viewer request and we have Ace Combat 4. So once again, and this is a broken record for me because it's going to continue, PS2 even at a 3 times resolution runs absolutely perfectly. For GameCube, we're at a 3x upscale and we'll start with one of the hardest to run games and the most requested that I've ever seen. We have Butt Ugly Martian's Zoomer Doom. I'm kidding, if you know, you know. Let's actually look at NBA Street version 3. And now let's look at the big ones. Here's Twilight Princess.
Okay, so those look good, but you're probably wondering, what about Rogue Leader? Big switch, follow me. And yeah, at a three times resolution, Rogue Leader doesn't run super well. It runs better than you'd think, but not perfectly. But if we bump that down to a native resolution, then Rogue Leader is more than playable. And I don't know if it gets a little bit harder to run later, but in this first stage, it's absolutely perfect. And continuing on, on that same note, we have Super Mario Sunshine, which again, is a joy to play here. For Wii, at a 3 times upscale, let's take a look at Donkey Kong Country Returns. And it's just more of the same. This is exactly like GameCube, it's the same idea. You're gonna be able to run a lot of Wii games here at an upscale if you wanted to. And so we come to that point in the video where I have to point out bonus consoles. So let's start off with Vita 3K and a two times upscale. And last on our list is Nintendo Switch. Starting with Link's Awakening because I wanted to use one game that actually needs a mod to work, or setting changes at least. If you don't mod this, you have the blur applied to Link, and so out of the box this runs fantastic, but it needs the mod to work. Moving to Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu, the gyroscope just works here, and I didn't even change any settings for it, it just works. The game itself runs really well too, with only minor hiccups. Let's look at a major one here, with Super Mario Odyssey. The start of the game has some dips and it isn't full 60, but as you continue playing and moving on, you're going to find some stages that are 100% full speed and playable. This is actually really crazy to see, but don't expect this for every single stage. Jumping into Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, and it's more of the same, except better. We're at a near 60 frame rate here almost throughout. As Yuzu continues growing, this will only get better, but this is what you get right out of the box with this handheld.
Next up is Super Mario 3D World. And this is also a game that right away you can just play. I don't know if everything just dies as you get to later levels, but with how well this runs here right now, I can imagine it would. Last but not least is Breath of the Wild, and I'm just going to jump off a cliff and then you're going to see me die to a guardian because I haven't played this game in years. But for performance, we're almost there for perfection. You can see minor hiccups again, there's dips, it's not perfect, but it works. This is a lot more playable than I would have expected. Let's wrap this up. This went way longer than I expected and I only wanted it to be a quick short video to just give you a quick first impression. As I mentioned, this was not a review. This was meant to be more informational and to just give you an idea of what to expect from this device. I'll have my full review up within the next week or so. I don't want this video to be any longer, so if you just want my quick first impression in an opinionated format, the word of the day is wow. Let me know if I missed anything that you want me to cover in my full review video. There's obviously a lot more to talk about and we'll get to that. Don't forget to like and sub to help this channel grow and hope you all have a good one.